Before you begin writing an offer to purchase, you should have completed the following addenda to the agreement. The Consumer Guide to Agency Relationships, the Disclosure of Agency Relationship, an Affiliated Business Arrangement Form, and all property and lead-based disclosures that are required for this particular transaction. Lines number one through three require that you name the buyer and the address of the property on which they are making an offer. It's important that you use the buyer's legal name or the legal entity's name. If two parties are going to purchase the property and obtain financing, both names must be on all forms. Fill in the complete address with the unit number if applicable. Also, make certain you include this parcel number known as an APN. In some cases, there are multiple APN or PPN numbers. If this is the case, make sure you include all of them on the offer. This information can be obtained from the MLS listing, Realist, or the County Auditor's website. Lines 4 through 15 are referred to as the Chattel Clause. This is where you must indicate what additional items transfer with the property. Carefully review this with the buyer. Compare the MLS printout with the form to ensure you've included everything the seller has offered to convey with the home. On line number 11, in the event there is a water softener, you must find out from the listing agent if the unit is owned or rented because a leased unit cannot be transferred to the new owner. Another thing to consider is if the bathroom mirrors are simply hung or if they are indeed affixed. Most modern mirrors are hung like pictures and must be written in specifically. If there are sheds and outbuildings, it cannot be assumed that they stay unless they are written on the purchase agreement itself. With that said, be sure not to include anything additional such as personal items, which include things like pianos, pool tables, lawnmowers, yard tools, hot tubs, and the like. This can create issues at the time of appraisal, and it's better to create a separate bill of sale between the buyer and seller to account for these personal chattels. If there are any items not included or that the buyer wants to ensure are removed, you can simply write these in on lines number 14 and 15. Lines 16 through 20 are filled out to indicate whether or not this is a secondary, also known as a backup offer. Most often, this will not be a secondary offer. If it is, it means that the buyers are to ensure that they are locked into secondary position in the event that the primary, fully executed offer falls through. Line number 22 refers to the full purchase price being offered. Line number 25 will require the amount of earnest money that you are collecting at this time from the buyer to be deposited into escrow with the title company unless otherwise required to be held by the brokerage. As a rule, we don't hold earnest money here at Greater Cleveland West. Up to $50,000 in purchase price, it is customary to collect $500 in earnest money. Up to $150,000, $1,000 is customary, and over $150,000, you should use the 1% rule. I cannot emphasize to you enough how important it is for you to collect an earnest money check at the time of the offer. Although our offer to purchase allows the option for a promissory note, I strongly advise against it. Line 32 requires you to calculate the remaining down payment that will be deposited in escrow at closing, provided this is a transaction involving financing. I strongly advise using a percentage rather than a dollar amount to avoid any issue in case of a short appraisal. You can also make the earnest money non-refundable, due at the time of the removal of inspection contingency or other special condition provided it's written out explicitly and agreed upon by all parties. Line 34 is the amount of the mortgage based on what remains of the purchase price after the buyer's down payment and earnest money have been deducted. In other words, Lines number 25, number 32, and number 34 should add up to the equivalent of the full purchase price. Below the mortgage amount, you will see line number 36, which requires you indicate what type of mortgage loan the buyer is obtaining. In addition, this is a line where you can write in any and all closing costs or prepaid items that the buyer is requesting the seller pay on their behalf. The correct verbiage is, quote, the seller agrees to pay X amount of dollars toward the buyer's closing costs and or prepaid items. Your loan officer will be able to provide you an accurate amount based on the type of loan the buyer is obtaining and the property taxes for this specific property. This is better than estimating a percentage for the buyer because if you overestimate, the overage is not returned to the buyer at closing. Rather, it's given back to the seller. This means your buyer would have overpaid and would not have received the full benefit of the money that they offered. Warning, 
It is not a best practice to write in things like to be determined by lender, TBD, or as required by lender on this line, as you may be potentially locking the buyer into a scenario they may or may not be comfortable with. Line 37 refers to the financing contingency. This means the entire transaction is dependent on the buyer's ability to secure full loan commitment. For the next few items in the offer to purchase, it helps to have a calendar in front of you. It is critical to remember that days refers to calendar days, with the exception of Sundays and government holidays as it relates to TRID and the closing disclosure. For all other purposes in our contract, days means calendar days and is inclusive of weekends and holidays. A calendar will help you plan for these and identify appropriate dates working around courthouse closings and the like. First, you must determine how long the buyer will have to bring their documents into the lender and make full loan application. This is entered on line 38. Three to five days is appropriate unless there are extenuating circumstances. There are some agents that don't want a buyer to make formal loan application until after a home inspection, and this is a huge delay in the process as well as a strong message to the buyer that they may not have made a wise purchase. The initial stages of the loan process and the home inspection should run concurrently if you hope to stay within a 45 to 60 day time frame. The clock starts ticking at the final date of execution for loan application. This is not to be confused with the date the offer is written or executed. On line number 39, you will count out 45 to 60 days from the last date for the buyer to make loan application on the calendar. Be mindful that you cannot close on a weekend or a holiday. Best days to close are Tuesday, Wednesday or Thursday, and try to avoid the very end of the month. If it's a conventional loan, 45 days is plenty of time. If it's a government loan, like FHA or VA, please allow 45 to 60 days. Finally, we're coming to the end of the first page of the offer to purchase. The last thing you need to do is calculate a closing date. On line 50, enter the date that all funds and documents are to be placed into escrow with the closing company. This should be at least five business days after full loan commitment, and that's the date that you entered on line number 39. Remember, there must be three days for the buyer to review the closing disclosure. On line number 51, enter the actual date that the title will transfer, which should be the next business day after the date that you wrote in on line number 50.